As we begin our service, we acknowledge that we live, work, and worship on the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish Coast Salish people. Thank you. Today is a... Advent is a season when, as a church, we anticipate the birth of Jesus, which took place 2,000 years ago, but we celebrate together at Christmas. Like a child waiting for Christmas presents, we anticipate the birth of Christ, who is the ultimate embodiment of God's loving presence. We live, we light the fourth Advent calendar to symbolize coming near to this history-changing event. In John, in John 3, 16, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him. We light this candle as a symbol of God's love for us and the world, embodied in the birth of Jesus. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you that in the birth of Jesus, we see the fullness of his great love for us. Lord Jesus, come that we may see your great love. God, your love for us is so great that you chose to be born in a stable, giving up power and privilege to offer the gift of your loving presence. Lord Jesus, come, that we may know more of your loving presence. We eagerly await the bir your birth, the greatest moment in human history. Amen. Can I invite you to stand, whether you're here or joining us online. Join us as we sing of the light of the world who has come. world waits for a miracle the heart longs for a little bit of hope oh come oh come Emmanuel a child prays for peace on earth and she's calling
spirit of hope, O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, that you chose to leave your bright, warm, and comfortable throne to come to this earth as a baby to this dark and muddy, cold place to be with us and to be one of us. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to give us life, to bring hope and love and truth and peace to us. And ultimately, Jesus, you came to sacrifice yourself, to give your life on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, that we would be free and forgiven. And scripture says that death didn't have the fin final word because you, Jesus, rose again three days later from the dead and you ascended to heaven. And you have given us the gift of your Holy Spirit that we can know you through your spirit that we can encounter you and worship you. You are God, Emmanuel, with us. And we thank you for the promise that you give us, that you are coming again. What a magnificent 
and marvelous and wonderful God you are. We bring you the praise and we give you thanks, Jesus. Before you have a seat, I invite our kids and our Creo youth to come forward and to meet their teachers. And if you're joining us online, welcome. This is a great time if you have kids to so go to 10th.ca slash kids and you can watch the kids program there. I invite you now to turn and to welcome those around you. And if you're joining us online, you can text or say hi to somebody in the room with you. We love having our 10th kids and our Creo here, so why don't we all say hey to our kids? And again, if you're joining us on home, recognize and say hi to the kids in there with you. My name is Craig, and I'm one of the pastors here at 10th. Our vision at 10th is to be a place where people from all different backgrounds can come to know Jesus, to be a place of spiritual transformation, seeking justice for all. If you want to learn more about our vision, our values, and see how you can get connected here at 10th, let me give you two really practical takeaways. The first one is you can go to 10th.ca slash hello to fill out a digital connect card, or you can fill out one of the physical connect cards in the pews in front of you. The second thing you can do is sign up for our Mount Pleasant newsletter. Go to 10th.ca slash subscribe. And the Mount Pleasant newsletter really is the best way to keep informed about what's happening in our community. I try to keep these uh, upfront announcements really short so we can go back to worship and to listen to the word in the sermon. And so our Mount Pleasant newsletter really is the best way to stay in the loop about what's happening here in the community. 10th.ca slash subscribe. Well, coming up this Friday is Christmas Eve. And for me and my family, it means our Christmas Eve services here at 10th. If you've never been to one of our Christmas Eve services, they are beautiful. They are candlelit services with carols, and they're family friendly. We're really excited this year for our two Christmas Eve services, 4 and 6 p.m. We hope you can join us Christmas Eve, 4 and 6 p.m. When I was a new follower of Jesus, I had, was just starting uh, studying at UBC. And I, I was a full-time student during the year, and then during the summer, I worked as a, a full-time laborer to pay for my, my studies. And when I became a new follower of Jesus, I learned about this practice of tithing, of giving the first 10% of what I was earning in the summer back to God and to the community. And for me, it was actually a pretty scary experience to give the little, from what the little bit that I had, to give it back to God and to others and to learn to trust him and to be generous. But to my surprise, I found that as I learned to be generous through my ties, I actually became generous in other ways as well. Generous to my friends, generous to my family, and even looking for ways to be generous to my neighbors. That generosity isn't something that we just turn on or turn off. But just like how an athlete's muscles and their speed grow over time as they, they practice and they work out, so too our generosity muscles also grow as we practice generosity together. That tithing is one of the core practices of the church because through it, we learn to be generous 
And we learn to trust God, not only with our finances, but with all of our life. You can give now by going to 10th.ca slash give, or as I did earlier this week, you can give on your 10th Church app as well. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for this core practice of tithing and the ways that it teaches us to be generous in an expensive city like Vancouver or wherever we're watching. We acknowledge that it's not easy to be generous with our finances, but that you call us to be a people who are generous, to live generously to you and towards others. And we do that because we're responding from the generosity that we've seen from you. That as we walk through this season of Advent, approaching the manger, as we see baby Jesus, you, God, Emmanuel, the incarnate God who has come to us, we see a tangible sign of your generosity. And we seek to respond by becoming more generous ourselves. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your generosity to us today in the person of Jesus and throughout all of history. Amen. Abel, can I invite you to stand with us once again as we worship? have a seat. Well, that is a joy, a joy to be able to worship. It's also a joy to be Family Life Pastor here at 10th, and a joy to share the word with you today. 
I was uh, recently on a flight heading back to Vancouver uh, from the US, and I was sitting in a window seat looking out the view of my window. I was sleepy. I was holding a cup of coffee with my head leaned against the window, and directly behind me there was a young father with his little girl on his lap. I couldn't see them, but I could hear them. And because I was leaned in close, it felt like I was a part of their conversation. And while I was looking outside the window, I could see pinks and oranges and purples lighting up the ridges in the mountains. And I could hear the father speaking to his little girl about what they could see outside their window and what they expected to happen next. And a little bit later, there was some turbulence in the flight. And without even seeing it, I could hear that the little girl was feeling anxious. And she was starting to protest and pull herself away from her father's hold. And the next thing that happened was really beautiful. I could hear the father start to sing over his little girl. And the song he sang consisted mostly of just two words. He sang, my girl, my girl, my girl, talking about my girl, my girl. And the whimpering stopped, and the little girl sounded secure again. And I could already hear them talking about what was outside the window, like their attention was back in sync, and she felt safe and secure. And more than that, the words that had been sung over her in that little tiny song was telling her about her identity, about who she was and whose she was. And that might sound like just an everyday moment between a parent and a child, but as family life pastor, I'm really passionate about what was happening there. It was a bit of brain and body science on bold display because we were created, we were designed to give and receive love. Alan Shore is a neuroscientist uh, who has studied what is happening in the brain during times like that, mutually shared moments of nurture between a parent and a child. And he's been able to show in his work the ways that the brain is lighting up in that little girl, uh, the way that the right brain limbic system is being lit up, the feeling part of the brain. Um, as she's being sung over and delighted in. And the ways that at the same time, that same part of the brain in the parent is being lit up as well. And what is even more powerful to me is that as that is happening, that part of the brain that's being lit up is the very part that is needed for future relationship, for future connections, for being able to uh, empathically be able to um, respond to somebody else's need. That little girl's being built up and restored, even as she's just being sung over with a little song. Well, I've done some songwriting in my own life through different seasons. Uh, as I was preparing to speak, I was um, prompted to go look for an old binder that had some songs that I wrote in different seasons of my uh, years. I found some songs that I wrote when I was growing up, songs that I wrote when I met my husband and I was falling in love, songs that I wrote when I uh, was a newlywed and I was imagining what it would mean to find a home and a smile and be able to remember forever together. I found songs that I wrote when I was expecting my boys. Uh, they're giants now, they're uh, in university. But uh, before they were born, um, I was waiting very impatiently, I might add, um, for, their, uh, for figuring out who they were and what it was gonna be like to know them and love them. I found songs that I wrote for them once they were born, and these were just little songs that I would sing to them every day when I'd put them down. Uh, for bed at night or when I would put them in their cribs for their naps. I sang those little ones enough that when my boys got just a little bit older, they would actually say to me, Mommy, will you sing me my song? Will you sing me my song, the one you wrote for me? Because they knew that I had actually tailored the verses just slightly differently for each of them to highlight something I cherished in them, something I delighted in. And love sometimes makes us sing with delight. 
I'm going to turn our attention to Zephaniah chapter 3. And in this passage, the people of Israel are in some ways being prompted to be songwriters of sorts. It says, sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. And why are God's people being instructed to sing songs? It says, for the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy, and the Lord himself, the King of Israel, will live among you. At last, your troubles will be over, and you will never again fear disaster. On that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, cheer up, Zion. Don't be afraid, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. But God's people aren't the only ones singing in this passage. It says, he will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. And the next verse, we hear from the Lord directly. I will gather you who mourn for the appointed festivals. You will be disgraced no more, and I will deal severely with all who have oppressed you. I will save the weak and helpless ones. I will bring together those who were chased away. I will give glory and fame to my former exiles. Wherever they have been mocked and shamed, on verse 20, it reads, On that day, I will gather you together and bring you home again. This love of the Father is described as one that delights and restores and pursues and brings a daughter home again. And this love is promised in a saving one who would come and live among his people. At Christmas time, we celebrate the love of the Father who promises us a love that is coming in Jesus, the love of Christmas. This love delights. It delights in God's people. We can imagine that it is as though we're given a picture of the Father holding God's people, holding daughter Jerusalem and comforting her tears and pushing the hair out of her face and drawing her in. But we'll miss the depth of this promise if we don't realize that in earlier chapters, the people of Israel were in deep need of this saving. They are described as being arrogant and proud. They're described as being... Um, violent and full of sorrow. They're prone to harming and hurting others, and in turn, they are experiencing broken relationship. They are harmed, and they are being harmed. They have forgotten justice, and they have this tendency to pull for things that will restore them that were never intended to bring restoration. This love of Christmas delights in us, but it also restores us. It restores us. And here at 10th, we are a community that is committed to admitting we need rest restoring. We need that restoration work. And as we join our story with God's grand story, we experience transformation or a restoring work that we could call restorying, because it rewrites our story. And this restoring work, it's made real in our lives when we are able to build relationship with one another, both in our large group gatherings like this or virtually as we gather from around the world, and we're being formed by God's word and God's people, it's also made possible in our lives when we dare to build meaningful relationship with one another close enough where we can be honest about the places in our stories not yet exhibiting this transformation. Do you have people like that in your lives? People you can be honest about, the places in your life where you have longing and hurt and gaps of love? 
We need that. Friends, I wonder in a room like this or for those of us watching where the gaps of love and longing exist in your own story. And I wonder where you find yourself reaching for things that were never meant to restore you. Shortcuts, counterfeit forms of love. I was reading in an opinion piece in the New York Times just last week, an article written by Maya Shalovitz, and she wrote an article entitled, Opiates Feel Like Love, and That's Why They're Deadly in Tough Times. And she writes a bit about her own story, how she'd gone through a really hard breakup and she was experiencing loneliness. And she had people in her life who were telling her, you know, there's these drugs that you can take and they feel like a warm, buttery love. She had people who were letting her know, hey, you can find a quick fix for that. You can put this into your body. And she wrote about the ways that opiates and other substances hijack the part of our brains that makes us feel like those important connections are happening, like the ones we talked about earlier, where a parent and a child are connecting. And it gives this false sense that you've just experienced love or you got to numb that part of you that's longing for it. She poignantly talks about the ways that during a pandemic and during periods of isolation, like a lot of us have been in in these hard months, that we often feel a longing for love and connection when we're away from those that we love and want to be able to spend Christmas with or be able to connect with, that we may actually go through feelings of withdrawal not dissimilar from what it's like when we're getting ourselves off of substances that we've been used to reaching for. And she shares a word that sounds an awful lot like a TED Talk that was featured a couple years ago by a man named Johan Hari, who spoke on everything you know about addiction is wrong. When she says the opposite of addiction is not abstinence. It's love. The opposite of addiction is not abstinence. It's love. Getting at that deeper need, that deeper longing that's actually sending us somewhere else to try and fill the gaps. But we need a love that actually does a deeper work, a transforming work, a love that actually meets the underlying need. And this is the kind of love that we talk about in verses, like the one that our young children learn very young. Maybe you've been raised in the church and you've heard John 3.16 since you were young and the words just fall right out of your mouth because you've got it memorized. Or maybe... You haven't been raised in a church, but you've seen it on sweatshirts or written on uh, books or pieces of paper somewhere. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This love that is promised to all peoples all peoples who would open their lives up to it and believe, the whole world. There's a pastor named Pastor David who wanted to preach on this verse, but he knew that his congregation members would hear it and be like, yeah, yeah, for God so loved the world. I've heard that verse for a long time, and they'd maybe know it here, but not hear it here, and not know that that love was the very thing that would help them in the places of longing where they were reaching for other things. And Pastor David, as he prayed over the ways that that would change people's lives and change the world, he was thinking about some of our words that we use when we do Christian baptism, like we have done just a couple weeks ago here, and we said, child of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Pastor David said, we need to add four little words to the end of those words. We need to say, Child of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, like it or not. 
And you hear those words and we might think that sounds a little strange or that sounds a little forceful. But there was a young dad in the church that day who heard that message. And a few days later, he was putting down his little boy, Benjamin, six-year-old Benjamin, down for bed. And Benjamin didn't want to go down for bed. Some of us who are parents in the room, we know that nighttime routines can be really magical and meaningful. They can also be real hard. (laughs) And Benjamin and his dad were having a night that was real hard because Benjamin didn't want to go to bed, so he tied up his hands and fists and he looked at his dad and he said, No, Daddy, I hate you! And his dad, probably a little surprised hearing these jarring words coming from his little son, looked at Benjamin and said, Benjamin, I'm I'm sorry, but I love you. Little Benjamin looked at his dad mad that he was still hearing love from him, and he said, no, Daddy, don't say that. His father said, sorry, Benjamin, but it's true. I love you. And Benjamin looked at his dad and covered his ears and said, no, no, Daddy, don't say that again, because he knew this kind of love was coming at him, even in his defiance and rejection. He was powerless to protest it. He certainly wasn't in control of it. And his dad, remembering Pastor David's sermon from a few days before, looked at his son and said, Benjamin, I love you, like it or not. That's the kind of love we celebrate this time of year. A love that shows up. We're nearly powerless to protest it. It's tenacious. And... At Advent time, we are invited to be near enough to the manger, to this good news of Christmas, as if we're peering right into the manger, expecting the coming of Christ, who shows up in our stories, in our world, like it or not. Not to have power and control over but we may be powerless to protest it because when it shows up, it rewrites our stories. It comes in such love that delights in us and restores us, and this love, it pursues us. And it's like a shared song. We are close enough to have it rooting us, reminding us who we are and whose we are. I can think of another moment that was a bit like this, a love that showed up in my story and changed me. I was in the southwest of Ireland, and I have to share with you part of my story for you to understand why I was there. I was born in Ireland. I lived there until I was just a little girl. And when my parents split up, my mom and my twin sister and I went to the US. My dad was originally from the UK. My mom was originally from the US. But my dad has lived in Ireland my whole life and has actually never been to Canada or the U.S., never been to North America, even today. And in those early years in the U.S., there were a couple of years that I was raised with a stepdad who was not a safe person, and he harmed me and my twin sister. And once we no longer had a dad in the home and I was still pretty young, I would every year get a letter from my birth father in Ireland, a long letter, maybe on Christmas time, Christmas day, maybe on my birthday in the summer, just a couple times a year. And I really wanted to understand that part of my story a bit more. I wanted to understand who I was, understand my own identity. So for my high school graduation gift, I asked for the one single thing I wanted, to be reunited with my father. And I gathered up all my courage to show up in Ireland and meet my dad for the first time since I was little. And I had started to let God teach me about that part of my story, and that was a short trip. And so two years later, I went back, and this is when I was in the southwest of Ireland. And I was asking God to teach me more, and I would wake up every day with a Bible in one hand, 
and a journal in the other, and I would just go on long hikes in the rolling hills. And uh, there's, there's a picture there of the valley that I would climb to, and I would walk long enough that there was the bay down below and the town, and I was up in the hills, and I would come to the crest of the hill, and I would climb down into that valley, and I would say my prayers out loud. I was doing a lot of wrestling and searching. And sometimes when I would pray out loud, it was just me and the sheep. So sometimes I would sing my prayers, and it didn't matter whether I sang them quietly or loudly, the sheep didn't mind. And some of you may hear that and think, um, Ash, I'm not really the singing out loud to sheep type of person. And that's okay, because we're using the feeling parts of our brain, and I'm just asking you to imagine what that might have been like for me. And one day, I was saying my prayers out loud, and I had a song come out of my mouth. And it was my voice, it was my words, but I can tell you, it felt like a shared song that was just sung over me. So much so that 25 years later, I can still remember the way it goes. It goes like this. Oh, my child, be still, be still. Oh, my child, I have come, I have come. See this beauty all around you. Rest and be assured. I will take you through your trials and your joys. And when those words came out of my mouth, I just crouched down in the mossy, wet grass, and I just cried. I cried because I had been reminded of who I was, and I was reminded of whose I was. I was reminded that I wasn't alone, that the Lord had come and was continuing to come in my story and make himself known. And some days since that time, I have felt like that song's just being sung over me while I'm walking through a trial or walking through a joy. I feel like the Lord is alongside me. And if I'm really honest, there have also been days and seasons where I have been wrestling and I'm a little bit more like my boys when they were little, saying, Will you sing me my song, Lord? Will you sing me that song one more time? That verse you wrote for me, those words you gave to me, will you sing it one more time and remind me? It's important that you hear from me as a sister in Christ and as a pastor here at 10th that this journey of restoration is one that is not once and done. It is an ongoing journey with the Lord as we invite his love to come again. And in my prayer time daily, it's like I'm asking the Lord to sing over me one more time. And I need people in my life that I can be frankly honest with and speak about the longings of my heart and the places where I might be tempted to reach for shortcuts to meet those needs. And if you don't have people like that in your story, where you can be bluntly honest, frankly honest about the longings of your heart or the shortcuts you're reaching for, for restoration, I'd encourage you to find someone. You can talk with us, talk with some of the pastors about finding a life group or a soul trio where that sacred time and work can be done. At Christmas time, we're invited to celebrate a father who sings over us, a son who is sent to live among us, and a Holy Spirit that continues to seek us even today and make himself known in our stories. I started by talking with you about a little girl who was on an airplane and needed a song to be sung over her with just a couple words, my girl. And then in sharing part of my own story, I've shared about the time when I was moved to get on another flight and fly around the world to find a hug and embrace that would secure me. But my encounter with the Lord has reminded me, I don't have to get on an airplane to find a love like that. The Lord has come. He enters close enough to us 
And we can find that love in our stories. Even today, the love of Christmas can be born in us. Jesus is the love we are truly longing for. Jesus is the love of Christmas. Let me pray with you. Singing God, you exalt over us with joy as we celebrate what you have done and what you are doing both in us and in your people around the world. As you delight in us, we too lift up our songs of praise and we ask you, sing it again, Lord, my song, our song, the song, the song that changes everything we know and everything we are. Renew us with your love today. We boldly confess we need it. Teach us to face our future with hope, peace, and joy. And teach our lives to sing your harmonies of love. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ash. When you came in, you should have received one of these communion cups. If you haven't received one, put up your hand and our Connections team will bring one for you. It's a good time if you're joining us online to grab bread and something to drink as we're going to take communion together in a moment. The end of the passage that Ash had read from Zephaniah says, At this time, I will gather you. At this time, I will bring you home. When we come to the communion table together, that's what God sings over us. Whether we feel far from God or close, at this time, I will gather you. At this time, I will bring you home. On the evening before he was betrayed, Jesus shared a meal with his 12 disciples, his friends. And during that meal, he took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said to them, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And then later in the meal, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks. Saying, this is the cup of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. When you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. When we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's love again and again. The one who promises to each of us today, I will gather you. I will bring you. I invite you now to peel back the top layer of your communion cup and to hold the wafer. We're going to take that together. And if you're online, just to hold on to a piece of bread for a moment, we're going to take this together. The body of Christ. A reminder that lo God's love is tangible, comes to us. Take and eat. I invite you now to peel back the second layer of your communion cup to reveal the juice, or if you're joining us at home, to hold on to the, the juice or some kind of drink and we will take it together. The cup of the new covenant, a reminder that God wants us to experience his love, to feel it in our bodies, to taste it with our tongues. Drink. I 
invite you to pray with me now. I invite you to open yourself to listen to God, whether it was in the scripture that Ash read earlier, a word that she spoke in a sermon, a lyric from a song that you heard, or a unique word that God speaks to you right now. What does God want to say and to sing to you in this moment? Lord, we thank you that we don't need to get on a plane to find a love that heals and restores. That whether we feel close or near to you, that you love us whether we like it or not. That as we celebrate this communion meal together, that you, Jesus, are the embodiment of of the Father's love for us and his invitation to come home. Amen. If you're able, can I invite you to stand again with us as we sing Silent Night. Continue with joy to the world. To the world, the Lord has come. Let us seek a king. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and 
you'd like prayer for anything on your way out, something that God spoke to you or an area where you want healing and restoration, I'll be over at our, our prayer banner over on your right to pray with you. On your way out too, if you're looking for any last minute Christmas gifts, if you're here in person, you can visit our missions table. They have some Christmas gifts and all of the proceeds are going to go to benefit our growing refugee community here at 10th. And now I invite you, community, to extend your hands in a posture of reception, whether you're here in person or online, to listen to these words. Hear the Father speak these words over you from Zephaniah. At this time, I will gather you. At this time, I welcome you home. As you leave this place, may you know the warmth and love of God, who, whether you feel close or far from him, desires for you to feel home, whether you like it or not. Go in the great love and grace of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.